Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Welcome to the online service for Swisson Park Primitive Methodist Church. We're so glad you're here, and we pray that you will be both encouraged and challenged today by the hearing of God's Word. John 20, verses 24 through 31, on page 1674 in your pew Bibles. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came <clears throat> with them. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may be believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate uh, you reading for us today. And I hope everybody's having a good day. Are you enjoying the change of the season? Okay. Is that working for you? Very good. How many of you are really just excited about uh, the fact that something may happen on Tuesday that hasn't happened in a while? Maybe snow? Okay. And uh, another thing, too, if you, if, how many of you like to look, what's the game? It's called hidden something in the house where you're looking for these different things and you press hidden treasure or is that what it's called? Well, anyway, if you go on Facebook, and I'll just give you this. If you look on the Trinity Christian Facebook page, look for a couple of kids on that Facebook page that you might recognize from the church here playing in the band. That's all I'm going to say. You might find someone wearing a funny hat, or you might find somebody. They, they had a, a, a concert recently outside, and uh, it was a fall uh, pet band concert. And check it out and see if you recognize anybody playing a flute or a trumpet, and uh, check them out, and uh, you might recognize it. So I'll just leave you that as well, okay? So other than that, um, what do you see when you look up on the screen? A marble? Okay. Yeah, I get that. It could be earth as well. Yeah. Who thinks it's a marble? <laughs> okay. A marble, okay. Who thinks it's earth? Let's pray. Lord, help us today as we look and see what you have for us from your word. And uh, we just simply pray today that we can take a moment and just hear from you as your word is before us. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When you think of the world, what scripture verse comes to mind? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever what? to not perish, but have everlasting life. And you know, Charlie Brown and Linus agree with you as well. The, the world needs Jesus. Okay? Is that Linus? Yeah, okay, make sure I got it right. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. The world needs Jesus. The world needs Jesus. And sometimes we, 
we get so distracted and we get so just pulled away and we forget the simple, basic, fundamental truth that the world needs Jesus. And my favorite Peanuts character isn't on this particular slide, but that would be Snoopy, okay? I always thought Snoopy was the epitome of coolness, and Snoopy was the one who was resilient, and Snoopy never let the crowd persuade him, but always was the one who was going to step forward and, and make his presence known. But here, these two guys as well are, are making that known today. So uh, just always be reminded that uh, the world needs Jesus. And so I got, I got a, a question for you now, okay? Who, who knows the answer? What is an, an antonym? If it's not a pastry, it, it's not a breath mint, it's, it's not a form of medicine, what, what is it? Something about a cinnamon roll? What? Sarah, of what? Whatever I'm talking about, it's the opposite. If you're left, I'm right. If I'm up, you're down, right? Don't you feel sometimes that's our world today? Okay, it's an antonym, okay? It's like no matter what I say, you're saying this. Wow. So I just thought I'd throw that at you, okay, and, and just get your thoughts. Maybe you can get one at the checkout line along with the peppermints and the antonyms and all those things. It'd be a great conversation. But think about this for a minute. When we think of antonyms, it's like Sarah said, they're opposite. Once, if it's cold, it's hot. If it's hot, it's cold. And, and again, you don't have to look too far in our world today to see that really that's what's happening. Okay? So it brings me to the next question. How many of you remember, if you could sum it up in one word, in one word, what was the subject matter of last week's message? Uh-oh. Uh, okay. What's the opposite of uh-oh? I'm certain, right? Or... Yeah, 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 what's the opposite of yeah, 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 no, no, no. But anyway, uh, what was it? If you could summarize it in one word. Well, it's almost like the hush that was across the Tennessee Stadium last night when Alabama would score a touchdown or something, okay? Oh, sorry, Krista, did I say that? One word. How would you, what would, would you use to describe last week's message? Poor? Horrible? I mean, what, whatever, think about, or let's say subject matter. What was it? All right? Anybody want to buy a vow? Jesus, yeah, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Jeopardy. No, okay. Here it comes. You ready? One word. Down. Down. How many of you say, yeah, now I remember. Now I remember. So in the spirit of of the antonym, what would be of doubt? Certainty, belief, all the above. And so when you consider it, here we are. And so last week we spent some time considering how doubt was injected into the mindset of man, and because they followed that trail of doubt, we see all the things that happen as a result of sin being brought into the world. And so if we're going to walk down that road of doubt, God help us to see the extreme opposite of that is what? To believe. To believe, really, to believe. Sarah sent a text yesterday, and, and I, I saw a picture, and I'm like, what is this? And I, because underneath she said, this is ridiculous, Okay. And guess what she was describing when I blew up the picture? It was the score of the Alabama-Tennessee game. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is ridiculous. But when we look around the world today, is that our answer as well? This is ridiculous. What are we doing? Where are we going? What were we thinking? What's driving us? And to think this whole thing began there in the midst of the garden by the injection of what? Doubt and uncertainty. And left to its own devices, what do you see happen? 
it continues to manifest and build into this thing that we look around today and see out of control. When you begin to doubt, isn't it scary what begins to happen? and What unfolds and what it goes to and how it just continues to just grow into this thing. And you say, how did this happen? And today, we want to take a few moments to consider, why don't I just believe? You're just saying, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. And I believe whatever the cost, and when time is, has surrendered, and earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. And that whole statement begins with what? I believe. And if I could shake your belief, guess what? Your whole world's going to unfold. It's going to crumble. And we live in a world today where the objective and the, and the whole purpose behind that person who masquerades as an angel of light is to cause you to unbelieve. To, to, to doubt, and through that doubt will cause disbelief and will cause all these things that will happen if you first entertain the concept of, did God really say that? Well, doesn't that sound like, remember Dark Shadows? <laughs> Barnabas Collins? Anyway, it sounds like the, that th the thing opening, but anyway, I... I, I What, there's a little latch up here in case you wonder, what are you talking about, Dennis? And my leg just hit it, and the door went going. Burr, burr, burr. I didn't know what was happening. I believe, though. I, <laughs> it's good. What about you? Why is it so hard to believe? Did you ever ask yourself that question? Think about this, for instance. I'll, I'll paint this, this picture. You've just been to summer Bible camp, and each day you were encouraged and challenged, and man, it's time to go home, and you're going to just light the world on fire for Jesus. Or maybe you were just at a weekend retreat, and man, you were charged, and you were energized, and you're resolved, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to light the world on fire for Jesus. You were in church, and you heard a message from last week about doubt that you completely forgot about. No, I'm just kidding. And, and, and you said, I'm going to go and light the world on fire for the Lord. What happens when we walk out that attacks that spirit and resolve of belief and sometimes it turns into doubt? What's going on? Why is it so hard sometimes? Satan, who is the God of this world, he has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, you can look it up and read it. It's there, it's real, it's true. Blinding the minds for you to not be able to see and to navigate but you know, sometimes we think we're pretty good walking in the dark, don't we? And you can navigate through your house in the dark, navigate in your bedroom through the dark, unless somebody moves something, and then what happens? Your toe says, you're not that good. And we try to play that same game in life at times, thinking, oh, I got this all figured out. But here's the reality when we ask the question, why is it so hard sometimes to remain true and steadfast and confident and certain in these things? And, and, and why does doubt just at times just come right at me? Because this is the passage that says the God of this world has blinded the minds. That's a fact, friends. That's from God's word. It's not speculation. It's not some just theorem that someday will be proven. No, it's real. This is what Satan has done and continues to do in such an exponential way around the world today that the minds of so many people will become blind to the things of God. Wow. So what do we do? In the second chapter of the book of Colossians in verse 8, we're going to paraphrase it this way. See to it that nobody takes you captive. Wow. If somebody's trying to take you captive, what are they doing? 
just offering you a, a weekend at a five-star resort? That might be the upfront approach. But when you're held captive, guess what? You're held against your will, and you're kept in a place that's contrary to the things that would bring you true joy and peace. And friends, there's a lot of people in the world today who are held captive because the minds have been blinded by the God of this age, and they've allowed doubt to direct and guide them. And at the end of the day, when it comes to the belief factor, it's not there. You know, we talk about relief factor. Maybe some of you take it. I know Sarah takes it. Liz, or what's your name? Krista, she takes it, okay? And helping with some pain and discomfort, inflammation. But guess what about the belief factor? Where is that in our world today? Believing. The total opposite, that antonym of doubt, is belief, being certain and having that understanding that it's real and it's true. And yes, serpent, God did say not to touch that. God did say I would die. Yes, he did say those things that I could stand up in front and proclaim this and not cower in the corner. Because, friends, this is the thing that's unfolding before us right as we speak today. There is a spiritual war that's raging. And the reality is simply this, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. And then Paul says to it, because of those things, see to it that nobody takes you captive. May the eyes of our heart be opened so we can understand that hope, that calling that God has given us. So in this spirit and in this verse in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul's asking for the the, the eyes of our heart to be opened. He's praying that the God of this world who's blinding the minds, it would be fought. And there would be resistance that no one's going to take me because I'm going to see for myself. And when I see and when I know, when I understand, it's a whole different way of life. Look around and see the world that we live in today and see the things that are happening. At the end of the day, how many people are really happy? I read a statistic just the other day, and you know statistics can be whatever you want them to be. But this statistic just blew me out of the water. 20% of people who profess to be believers only have a biblical worldview. 20% of people who profess to be believers have a biblical worldview, meaning they see the world through the eyes of the Bible. They see the world as God defines the world. They see society. They see culture. They see this plan as God defines what's right and what's wrong, what's up, what's down, what's left, what's right. They see it through his eyes, and that's what we call a biblical worldview. And I'm so thankful for Christian schools that teach biblical worldviews, and Trinity is one of them, that teaches that perspective and challenges you in your rhetoric and logic to see and understand what's happening, not that you're insulated from it, but through the eyes of God, through his word, how I as a believer function and navigate and carry out the plan that God has for me in this time. And so today, as we come to this point to say, the mind, the eyes, the reality of what's happening, that's why it's so hard. And we're told to make sure that no one holds you captive. So what do we do? Where do we go? Do we just stay in the church and pray that the Lord comes and we don't have to go outside and be affected by anything? We just pray we can go to summer camp forever and never have to come home and make the world go away? We just hope that if we just ignore it and kick the can down the road, you know, it'll be easier than being confronting one somebody and getting in their face. No! But what do we do? What do you consider yourself today when it comes to the things of the Lord, a doubter or a believer? Well, I'm in church. What do you think? Well, you tell me. When it comes to the reality of what life brings us each day, do I live my life as a doubter or do I live my life as a believer? Do I live my life as someone who has not been taken captive by the things of this world? Do I live my life as somebody whose eyes of my heart have been opened, my mind is clear, and it focuses upon the things of the Lord? 
Or maybe we think a little bit of Eve last week when the serpent said, did he really say that? And we say, huh. So what do we do? Do you ever face struggles in your life? Do you ever face challenges? You walk around and people say, hey, you're a Christian. Take it up top. Yeah, you know, it's, it's the most popular cool thing to do. No, the Bible says there's a battle. And there's a battle that's raging. And this battle is around us. And so here's three things I want to leave with you today to say, how do I combat? How do I make myself strong in my belief and understanding of who Jesus is and communicate that message in the world that I live in today? Is that a fair way to look at this? Before we do, in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 24, when Thomas, who was one of the twelve, wasn't with them, the other disciples said, hey, we've seen the Lord. And what Thomas say? I doubt it. Well, he didn't really say that. He said, unless I do what? Get to see for myself. And the prints on his hands and my finger into the print of the nails not going to believe. So maybe you have some stipulations before we go any further to say, look, unless this, this, and this happens, I'm not in. And then you know what happens eight days later. Jesus comes to these guys with the door shut and said, peace to you. And he said, Thomas, reach your finger right here. Look at my hands. Put your hand right here. See and know that it's real. And you know what Jesus said at that point at the end of verse 27 in John chapter 20? Stop being a baby. and Grow up. Well, no, he didn't say that. Stop doubting and believe. How many times is our response to these things just based on immature understanding and conduct instead of standing up and believing and being true and standing for the Lord? And Jesus said to Thomas, stop it. Stop doubting and believe. And you know the rest of the story as it goes on because he says, you're really blessed because you get to do this. But there are going to be other people who don't get to do what you've done, Thomas. And they're just going to be so blessed because of this in their life. And maybe you're here today saying, you know, you don't understand why it's hard for me to believe. And you don't understand why doubt sometimes has this way within me. And guess what? Maybe I don't. But I believe those words, as Jesus said to Thomas, are the same for you and me today. Stop being a baby. No, he didn't say it. He said, stop doubting. I translate, stop being a baby. And grow up and believe. Peter talks about the things that we understand as infants in the Lord, but as we grow and mature in Christ, stand up and believe. Because there's things that you and I are facing every day that no one else faces. There are circumstances that you and I are in that maybe no one else is in, but you know what the common bond that we have in each of these matters? It's our relationship with Christ. And the attacks that the world and these flaming darts of the world aim at us to take us out. So three things I want to share with you that hopefully will help you prevail in this battle to believe. You know what the first one is? Believe, first of all, that the battle is the Lord's. Okay? It's the Lord's. Where does that come from? Did we just find a clever PowerPoint slide? Well, that's really cool. The battle is the Lord's. Where does that come from? How about this guy named David? In 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, all this stuff is going on, and it gets to the 47th verse, and David says, what's the deal? You guys are over here cowered up in the corner. Stop being a baby and stand up to this Goliath instead of cowering and wondering what's going to happen because every day, what did the giant do? He came out and got in the face of Israel and says, you're nothing but a bunch of losers. Really, I'm paraphrasing. You're worthless. The God that you serve and these things that you believe are true, they're nothing. Look at me. This is what it's all about. Who can take me? And if you can't, look what you're made of. Well, friends, isn't that what happens in the world many times today? 
We believe that the message of the kingdom, it, it's outdated. We believe this, we believe that, and all the things that are happening in this ever-changing world. And almost as the church, we become apologetic, and we almost cower around and hope no one sees us instead of saying, the battle is the Lord, so stop messing with me, Satan. This isn't mine. It's his, and stop introducing doubt in my heart, but it's his. And what was the weapon of choice that this long man was getting? He's reaching down to get a little stone. You might be sitting there thinking, well, what can we combat with and what can we throw back and what can we do? Friends, remember the story of David. It's not yours, it's his. And stop believing the things that the doubter is throwing in your face to make you join him as well. It's not yours. Don't you feel just like Goliath said to David, the world saying to you and me today, I dare you dare you to be a Christian. I dare you to say the name Jesus. I dare you to stand up and have an opposing view to some world popular perspective today. I dare you. Well, if I do, you won't understand what happens at work. If I do, you won't understand what happens at school. If I do, you won't understand what happens at that family gathering. If I do, and you fill in the blank, and at the whole time, Satan is laughing. Got another one. Got another one. Because, friends, I use the word battle in this content of Scripture in 1 Samuel 17, verse 47, but also that word battle is describing your life and mine today. There is a battle that's raging, and that battle's between light and darkness. Not against rulers, but powers and principalities of this world. I'm part of God's family and part of his plan and his purpose. And David reinforces that to his brothers and to his fellow countrymen. Look, guys, it's real. And in just a matter of moments and with that little stone, everything changed. And all these individuals on the opposing side did what? Ran for the hills. Because someone says, it's not mine, it's his, and did what? You ready? Believed it. Believed it. What about you? Who's telling you today or saying to you, I dare you? What metaphoric giant is in your face saying you're nothing, you're a loser, you're worthless, you're church, you're this? And they go through the whole lineup. And you just stand there. Day in, day out, day in, day out. That was happening here with Goliath. And here comes this little guy out of nowhere that brings the answer and brings victory. Why? Because he believed and knew that the battle was the Lord's. So today, if you want to find a key, a key that Thomas needed to have, a key that you and I need to have, this is God's. In front of you, Thomas, is God's plan being fulfilled through his son. Sin and death have been defeated. Do you believe that, Thomas, or do you not? And Thomas had his stipulations in play, and thankfully he was able to see those fulfilled. And I don't know what yours are today, but I want to believe God fulfills those if you're going to believe him today. What's the next point? How about this one? When you pray, what happens? God listens. When you listen, God talks. And when you believe, what happens? God works. You see that happening in your life today? Think of somebody who was told simply what? No more prayer. And if you pray, you'll die. Okay? So what did this person do? Cease to pray? They continued to pray. And next thing you know, this person was taken by the civil authorities. This person was sentenced to death. 
This person was thrown into the den of lions. And then what happened? God looked. Think about that. Of all the things that Jesus demonstrated in his world here, in his, his life here on this, on this planet as he walked and talked here, was the necessity to pray. So many times we have good intentions and, and things that are just off the chart, but we fail sometimes to just throttle back and pray, to throttle back and listen. To see and understand how deep our depth of belief truly is. We can't pray enough. We're told to pray without ceasing. The battle is the Lord's. And, and David knew and understood those things, but he also knew and understood what it meant to have God do that work as he prayed and as he listened. What about you today? How much time do you pray a day? I'm not being the prayer police. With uh, okay, parents, you know this as your as your kids move to different places and they're part of this, in our case with our girls in school, we get to see Sarah more because she she's close. Elizabeth's further away, and because of those distances, sometimes and even Sarah being right here in Oakland, we might not talk for a long time because of just things. And you have that yearning inside, and you say, "I can't wait to talk to them." What about the Lord? How important, how essential is it in your life to talk to him? And not a one-way conversation, but to do what? To listen to him. And you know what? When Daniel was given that ultimatum, guess what he said? Marcia's comment, never mind. I don't really care what you're saying. I'm going to do what I believe God has for me. And he did. There's a lot of things going on in your life today that are really difficult. We heard today requests for healing. We heard requests today for comfort, for peace, for guidance. We heard requests today for people to deal with the loss of a loved one. We've heard requests today because of the ongoing violence that's in our world today. And Jesus, in his same situation, did what? saw and demonstrated prayer to be the key. So today, what's going to enhance my understanding as I look at the concept of believing? This is God's. And God has called me to do what? Pray and call and cast my cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for me. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me that I'm one of his. And the joy that we share as we carry there, none other has ever known. What about this one? Just lift up your hands and let no one take you captive. What are we talking about here? Was Moses at Niagara Falls? Sort of looks like it, huh? Oh, this is great. He just got up from a nap. I don't know. Is that from the choir trip, Sarah? I don't know. Is that Matani? I'm not sure, but anyway. Um, the story of Israel. And Israel had been released, and they got to the Red Sea. And who had changed their mind? Pharaoh. Pharaoh mounted up the soldiers. They got the horses, the chariots, and we're on the move. Israel, in their journey, comes to the Red Sea. There's no options for them to escape the approaching hoofbeats. So one of the response simply was, wouldn't it have been better if we stayed to Egypt and we at least had food, we had things, and you brought us out here to die? What was the attempt, or what was the desire of Pharaoh coming after Egypt? Well, to restore some of his singed pride, I'm sure. Taking them back to be captive 
to be slaves to his desire. Because what was going to happen now? Without these people there, who's going to have to do the work? We're sure not going to do it. Let's go get that free help. They defy. They think Pharaoh. So off he went. And the desire was to take these people back and have them to become part of the desire or the decree of the taskmaster. What do you do? You ever been like Israel? All of a sudden, things just changed, and there you are, metaphorically up against the Red Sea. And here come the approaching hoofbeats of someone, something that wants to take you back captive. And you don't have a choice. You're not that good of a swimmer. Can't outrun the horses. Oh, well. Let's quit. I don't know what you're looking at in life right now to justify quitting, throwing up your hands in submission to the captive, thinking that there's nothing left. But isn't it amazing when you read this passage of Scripture what Moses is doing here? And it's important, and that's why I wanted this particular slide to show this. He wasn't surrendering to Pharaoh. He was surrendering to the power of God. I have nothing. I have nothing. But God said to Moses, I'll stretch your hand over the waters and his staff in his hand. And what did God do? He opened those waters. You may have nothing left in you, physically, emotionally, mentally. You're at the end of the journey. There's nothing left. And the, the result of this would be Israel would be hauled back captive. I know it's God's battle. And I'm praying and I'm believing, but why am I at this impasse in my life right now? There's nowhere to go. Has God left you? No. So why do we say there's nowhere to go? There's nothing left. The prayer of Moses simply was, God, show us and remove yourself from all the haters and what they're saying. And God says, lift up your hands and stretch them over the waters. And you know the rest of the story. Maybe that's what God's calling you today to do. You're at the end of the journey. You're at the end of the rope. And it's so much easier just to give in and forget it and all the aggravation is gone and you'll go back willingly to be a slave. Friends, that's been the lie of Satan from the beginning. So the simple question is today, do I believe God? Do I believe him? When you leave here today, I pray that you leave here with a certainty in your heart, an assurance, a confidence within. Does that mean you'll be exempt and free from ever doubting again? No. Remember the story in Matthew chapter 9? Jesus is here and the dad is concerned over his son. His son needs healing. His son is overwhelmed by the evil spirits. And the simple question to the dad was, do you believe this? And I'm going to paraphrase because what's the response from the dad? I do. 
says, help my unbelief right now. And maybe that's where you're at today. You believe it. But boy, there's just some unbelief and doubt that stirs inside. And I want to encourage you today to know and understand that this is God's. And if you believe that it's God's, believe that prayer is part of that equation that brings victory. If you believe it's God's today, believe and know and understand that you can lift your hearts and lift your hands and that he will deliver you. He'll cause the miraculous. He'll cause the impossible. He'll cause whatever needs to happen for you to know and understand that it's real and it's true. The opposite of doubt is belief. And as we close this morning, that's our challenge for you. Do you believe this? And are you willing to say, God, I'm going to trust you more each day, each moment, each hour with the hardship and opposition as I believe and trust that you're going to do the miraculous because the norm of the world will no longer be the standard that which I follow, but my desire to stand for you and for people to see and know your promise and power in everything I do and say, be real. We're singing in the song as simply as this, I have decided to follow Jesus. And part of that song is, though none should join me, still I will follow. The cross before me, the world behind me, I've decided, and this is what I'm doing. Maybe today will be that day you say, Jesus, that's what I'm doing. Maybe today's the day you say, hey, you know what? I'm going to renew and affirm in my heart this faith today that I'm no longer going to allow doubt to control me. I'm going to believe and decide. There's no turning back because I know it's of the Lord. I'm going to believe. I'm going to pray. I'm going to trust. And I'm going to see God do the miraculous through me. I want to walk out of here today with certainty in my heart that it's real and it's true. I pray for all of you that that's your heart today. I pray and pray and pray that you will not allow the God of this age to blind your mind, to cloud your heart with that understanding that he's real. But today do what? Let no one take you captive. Today stand and see the, the hand of God as you say, I've decided. No turning back. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for loving us when we didn't love you. Thank you for being consistent, steadfast, and true. And we know that there is a battle and it's raging, and we're praying today that we could be strong and courageous and not give in to the concept of doubt, but simply believe. As we know, Lord, this is yours. The battle is yours. We can call upon you. We can cast our cares upon you. We can commune with you. We can see and understand. And through the midst of all these things, we can see the miraculous and the victory. Just as the sea parted, we're praying, Lord, for that obstacle today that's caused us to believe you've left us. Restore, Lord, our understanding and our heart and our eyes and our mind today. Maybe today is the day someone says, Jesus, come into my heart. Maybe someone says today, I'm renewing afresh my commitment to believe and follow you. No turning back. Maybe someone says today, I do believe, but please help me with my unbelief. Lord, wherever we find ourselves, as we sing this in closing, may it be a time of renewal, commitment, confession to you. For your glory and honor, we ask this in Christ's mighty and holy name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. For more information on how to stay connected, go to www.swisshomeparkpmchurch.com. God bless you.